Alrighty, welcome back. We are moving right along in the first unit of AP Psych, which is Scientific Foundations, this set of notes being on ethics in psychological research. So make sure you've got those notes from my TPT store, which you can see linked below this video, and let's get started. Here are the learning targets, and you'll notice that it's really all about the ethical guidelines that the APA sets out, and also, more importantly, really about who regulates that. So we'll kind of go through all of that here in this set of notes. So the big thing is who says it's ethical? Who says that certain research practices are ethical or not? Well, it's the American Psychological Association, which we talked about a couple notes ago. They have a code of ethics that was created in 1953. And then it's actually the institutional review boards called IRBs, which are panels that approve the research or reject the research. Now those IRBs actually exist per institution or regional location. So for instance, colleges, right? Universities actually have their own IRBs because they are kind of commissioning professors to go out and do big research projects. So they have their own IRBs. Um, they also have them in kind of regional locations to make sure that everyone's following those guidelines. So what makes it ethical. And there's some really key principles that you need to take away here about ethics in research. The first one is informed consent. And there's really two ideas with this one term and that participants or potential participants have to be completely informed about every aspect of the study that may influence their decision on whether or not they're going to participate um, and ensuring that participation is in fact voluntary. And that's the second part that the participant has to give consent that yes, I know about the research. Yes, I know it's voluntary and I can walk away anytime and I'm going to sign on the line that says I give consent. Now, assent, A-S-S-E-N-T is like informed consent but for minors. Minors, anyone under the age of 18 can't sign a legal document, which is what informed consent is. So in order to use children, in order to, um, yeah, in order to use children in research, they have to continuously be asking the child, right? The experimenter or the researcher is continuously asking the child, are you okay? Do you feel good about this? Do you understand what's going on? And they have to get those positive responses from kids in order to proceed. So an interesting story is I knew a professor, they actually did some professional development training for me way back when. She would take her children to her university where they were doing various research experiments and stuff like that that involved children. Of course, she would be the guardian, right, and would consent, but then they had to get continuous assent from the child. She would be present in most cases, making sure that everything was safe. The next term that you really need to understand is what's called limited deception. So you must only deceive people in an experiment or piece of research when it is absolutely essential to the nature of the study. And you must then tell about the deception. You must tell about the deception to the participants once the study is over in what is called debriefing. And I need you to underline, highlight, circle that word debriefing. So when the study is all said and done, every single participant must be debriefed but it's especially important when deception is involved. And the idea of debriefing is that the participant must leave the experiment, leave the research in the same way that they arrived, physically, emotionally, mentally, all of the above. So an interesting story about this was in college, I knew of a person who um, was of age, was over 21, and gave informed consent to participate in this research study about how alcohol contributed to flirtatious behaviors, let's say, with the opposite sex. So they were put in a room, she was given a couple beverages, right, alcoholic beverages, and then a handsome young fellow walked in and they kind of measured her conversation with that person when she was intoxicated compared to when she was sober. Now, once she became intoxicated, her debriefing included explaining everything, but also her sobering up. She couldn't leave the building 
still intoxicated. She had to be sober once before she could leave. So that's just an interesting one about debriefing there. And then protection from harm and discomfort is a big one. You must minimize any discomfort or risk involved in the study and must act to prevent participants from suffering any long-term negative consequences, right? There can't be any short-term or long-term negative consequences for sure. Um, and then finally, they have the participants must be told that they have the freedom to participate and they can leave at any time. All right, moving right along. The next one is confidentiality in that any personal information about the participants must be kept secret or confidential. And the report, the results really have to be reported in such a way that personal information is not disclosed. And that actually also has to be stated in the informed consent form. Now debriefing, kind of spoiler alert, I already talked about that a little bit, but it's key to understand that that's at the end, right, of a research study. And again, it has to reveal all relevant information about the true purpose of the experiment if deception was was used um, and then they have to leave the same way that they arrived and that's that professor's alcohol experiment where she participated was intoxicated had to leave sober this is an example of a consent form um, it kind of takes you through the whole i understand and each component of the research and who is involved and then signing at the bottom that was really talk about humans. Now let's talk about animals because there really are separate guidelines for using humans in research and using animals. So let's back up a little bit and talk about why. Why would psychologists, why would scientists use animals and not just humans if it's human behavior that we're studying? Well, behavior is interesting in and of itself even if it is coming from animals, because we have similar behaviors, right? When we feel hungry, we eat. Well, what does that look like physically? And so they do that experiments that way. Because research with animals can give information that would be impossible to figure out from humans or unethical to collect from humans. So you have a little more leeway in the damaging or long-term effects on animals when using animals in research than you do with humans. And so you can kind of infer really crucial information that you wouldn't be allowed to find out with humans. So animals are not usually subjected to extreme pain or starvation or other inhumane conditions. That's not allowed. But if animals are to be harmed in research, it must first be deemed necessary to benefit human welfare or else it's not done. It's not even okayed for research. It wouldn't even be approved. You can't just hurt them for pain's sake. It's got to have a very direct link to how it's going to benefit humans in the long run, like in Alzheimer's research or cancer research, something big like that. There are guidelines to how to care for the animals, and that's really where the differences in ethics comes in using humans versus animals but it's care in keeping them over the long haul of the research, not just when they are being researched on, if that makes sense. So who says it's ethical? Again, it's the APA's Code of Ethics, created in 1953, and animal research must also be approved by an institutional animal care and use committee. So it's kind of like an IRB, but with animals. So what has to be done? Well, with animals, you have the ABCs, of laboratory animal research and that it's appropriate, beneficial, and caring, ABC. So appropriate means nothing cruel and unusual. Again, there has to be a direct link if pain is gonna be used or harm in any way to benefiting human welfare. Beneficial, again, has to benefit human psychological research and caring. And that's really the big difference is that you must care for the animal's well-being, even if they aren't being used in the lab right now. So there's regulation on number of cages available per animal, clean cages, how often they're clean, fed, and watered, etc. So that wraps up our, our ethics notes. Next, we're going to be getting into the nitty gritty of research. So go ahead and click to find that video where you're watching. Make sure you grab those notes from my Teachers Pay Teachers store, and we'll see you then.